Character archetypes. What are they? Why are they useful? What are the challenges in using them well? I'm Simon from Games Deconstructed and in this video I aim to answer these questions and more. The video has been timestamped for your convenience, as always you'll find the list in the description down below, and while I have your attention I'd like to cordially invite you to subscribe to my channel. Lately I've been blessed with a large increase in viewership and I'm hoping for this sub number to match that someday, so I'd be much obliged if you clicked that button down below. Having that out of the way, let's get down to business. What's a character archetype? Before we answer that, let me introduce you to my friend. We can all see that he's quite a burly gentleman, wielding a large axe. That and his stern expression is pretty much all we can see at first glance. But if I were to ask you about his combat style, for example, you might be led to assume he's a slow character who packs a punch in combat, probably not too difficult to pick up if he's playable. Same thing would happen if I were to ask you about his role in the story. I think you'll agree that he's more suited towards being a villain, maybe a miniboss of some sort. Now, neither you nor I have probably seen this character before, that's because I've made him up for this video. Then how come we can make judgement calls on his characteristics that are not based on this single sprite? That's because we immediately recognize him as a part of a group of characters we do know, based on the characteristics we can see. That grouping is what we call a character archetype. It's a pattern of similar characters that reoccur in otherwise unconnected works of fiction. The pattern relies upon which characteristics commonly appear together, so even though a physically massive character wielding a rapier is not unheard of, bodily bulk is associated with wielding a weapon of equally impressive stature. The two key factors here are that an archetype has to encompass more than one character, otherwise it's just a character, and the characters have to appear in two different games. It could be two games from the same franchise, but you know, with two characters we are talking about the bare minimum. When a new character is first introduced to the audience, it's compared to a sort of mental checklist in the viewer's mind. As a result, it's assigned to the archetype it has most in common with. As with most cases of repetition, this reinforces the importance of some of these tropes and themes, further cementing the archetype. No character will fit the mold exactly, of course, as the very existence of the mold is a result of comparing the similarities and differences of multiple characters. Should a character leave enough of an impression and some of their errant, non-archetypical qualities be reinforced by future inclusions to the group, that archetype's prototypical trait set will change to fit that. Should the archetype grow internally contradictory as a result of these changes, it can be divided into two or more groups, sub-archetypes if you will, of their own. For example, our large bruiser archetype here could be split along the morality axis into the malicious brute and big softy categories. Much like the example provided by our large companion before, we are led to assume that the character will have some of the other prototypical characteristics even if they are not readily apparent. And it's these assumptions that are supremely interesting to me, as no game exists in a vacuum and we have to take into account the contextual factors affecting the reception of our favorite characters. TLDR, an archetype, is a group with a common set of traits. These traits can be narrative, bad guy, good guy, stern, easygoing, or functional. Burst damage versus sustained damage dealer, easy to play versus hard to master, etc. We can also make assumptions about other archetypical traits of the character belonging to the archetype unless the game shows us otherwise. We can assume a life character with a rapier to not be a tank, for example. How are archetypes useful? The process of assigning a character to an archetype in the viewer's mind is unavoidable. Unless you were to make a character that's literally incomprehensible to anybody, but that doesn't feel like it warrants the effort, does it? So knowing that it's going to happen, how do you make this process work in your favor? First of all, playing into the assumptions players will make about the character at first glance eases the burden of explicitly explaining upfront what the character is and what they do. If I'm playing League of Legends and I pick Ash, one of the available champions, I will intuitively know that she's a ranged character, probably a squishy one, with a focus on damage dealing. 
I can find that information in a guide, of course, or confirm it by playing a game. But upon first seeing the hero, I will intuitively know whether they will provide a playstyle I enjoy, thus lowering the risk of having a bad time with a character that's just not for me. It also gives the players a welcome sense of familiarity, as they tend to gravitate towards members of the archetype group they found enjoyable in their past experiences. If I'm starting a new MMO, I'll probably pick the class closest to my ideal playstyle, a heavily armored, sword and board tanky guy. I know I've enjoyed playing a martial tank with a large health pool, damage reduction skills, etc. in other games, and based on the presentation of the character, I can intuit which character class will fit that playstyle the best. It also provides a common ground in communication about a game. One good example of this is the Jagan archetype from the Fire Emblem franchise. Named after the OG member of the category, Jagan, it applies to a character that starts out more powerful than the rest of your team, but doesn't really scale well, and peters out by the time endgame comes. Narratively, they are most likely older men, sort of mentor figures to the younger generation of characters, but what's important is that I can use a single word, Jagan, to explain their mechanical benefits and difficulties to a fellow player by tapping into their existing knowledge, even if I'm talking about a different character than Jagan, possibly from an installment my conversation partner is unfamiliar with. The Jagan is also interesting because it shows us an example of a franchise-specific archetype. You can also have genre-specific ones, like archetypes that only appear in RPG games. Another, more risky proposition, is playing against archetype in character design. That's leading the viewer to believe that a character is a member of one group and then having them show characteristics that contradict the assumptions the viewer would make as a result. A great example of this is Bob from Tekken 7. His appearance, what you see initially, is fertile ground for making judgement calls about what his mechanics are going to be. Before Bob, fat characters in fighting games were an archetype without much depth, approaching stereotype territory rapidly. A stereotype is basically an archetype that's overused and we grow tired of it as a result. Sugar Punch Design Work has a great video on the topic of fat characters in fighting games, which I'll link, you can see the link over here. So when an archetype is in dire need of a bit of fresh air and variety, that's when it's ripe for a character to be designed going against it. Enter Bob. At first glance, he fits the mold, leading the viewer to dismiss him as a joke character, but he's presented differently from his predecessors, both in the narrative and functional sense. Narratively, Bob's wave is not a subject of jokes, but a key factor in his fighting competence. He's a self-assured character who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best without a hint of laziness, food obsession or lecherous nature, the common negative traits that were starting to tire out among his archetype co-members. Functionally, he's much faster than you would expect, with an acrobatic fighting style that would traditionally fit a smaller character. You can see the deliberate nature of the developer's decision to portray him like this, to go against archetype-based expectations. And this decision bore fruit, because the characterization is internally consistent. Both form and function are treated seriously and positively for Bob. And as a result, he is able to power through being at odds with his archetype and emerge as a popular inclusion in the Tekken roster. The last part paints both following and contradicting archetypes in a positive light. But both of these approaches can work against the impression a character makes. Following an archetype too closely, an archetype that's overmined in a franchise or genre, or just an archetype that's unpopular for other reasons, can cause the viewer base to dismiss the character as archetypical, sometimes to the point of ignoring parts of their characterization in favor of making assumptions about them. One example of this trend affecting a character's popularity before they even get a fighting chance is what the Smash community dubbed the too many swordsmen problem. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is a game that allows you to pit Pikachu against Pac-Man or Mario against Mega Man. But among the multitude of playable heroes, fans found an archetype that they felt was overrepresented, felt sameish, and generally rubbed them the wrong way. The anime person with a sword. 
While all these sword fighting anime looking characters play at least slightly differently and come from different franchises, the overlap of traits between them was too great for the player base. As a result, the inclusion of Byleth, a Fire Emblem protagonist with a sword, garnered a rather negative reaction. The archetype was considered overrepresented, and the new character was assumed to be following it too closely, even before their full functionality was known. Should the characters within the group have been more varied, or the new character was an anime swordswoman associated with other characteristics than the ones the previous characters had, there's a possibility that they would have gotten a more positive outlook from the public. On the other hand, going against established archetypes willy-nilly presents similar dangers. The circumstances here are reverse. It's generally unwise to go against popular archetypes that are well respected within the community. There's a bait and switch psychological phenomenon at work here. The initial assumptions a player makes based on an archetypical factor may make them less receptive to getting a character that's fundamentally different from what they expected. If I'm picking up an MMO and I pick a character that looks like a DPS caster, smells like a DPS caster, and probably also tastes like one, though I'm not too anxious to try, I'm not gonna be too happy if it turns out at max level that he's only viable in raids as an off tank. Similarly, players are quite aware of when a subversion of expectations is used as a crutch for actual characterization. If the unexpected trait of a character doesn't enhance their other characteristics, forming a cohesive whole, then it's very possible that it'll be considered an inversion of the stereotype, which is still a part of that very stereotype and considered lazy design. So there you have it. You now know what character archetypes are and that both their use and contradiction can be a double-edged sword depending on their implementation. Let me know in the comments below what's a character archetype in gaming that you'd like to never see again. Also, don't mean to be a bother, but you should really click that sub button to know about future videos and make me a very happy man. As always, thanks for watching, have a beautiful day, and I'll see you in the next one.